How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast. A podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jan. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. What's going on? You know what? Not really much. Just watched the Oscars last night. Was very excited that Mm -hmm. Brad Pitt won for the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I really did like that movie. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of other people didn't. I did. Never saw Parasite, but I plan to watch it this weekend or Mm -hmm. sometime this week. Really interested in seeing Jojo Rabbit. I didn't really see much of the movies this year. Let's put it that way. I watched Harriet on Saturday morning, Mm -hmm. and I was blown away. I love the actress that played her. Holy moly. Let me just tell you a little bit about her. I saw her on the Oscars, and she sang the song, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Step Up, the song from She wrote that. You know, she wrote Mm -hmm. that, too. Yeah. She's on her way to be an EGOT, the Emmy, Grammys, Oscar winner, and Tony winner. That's mm-hmm. like the big, sh- she's on mm-hmm. her way. And I was watching her sing and I'm like, oh my God, her voice is phenomenal. It really is. Phenomenal. And then I was looking at her and I'm like, she's beautiful. She's mm-hmm. a beautiful lady. And then I'm like, she looks familiar. And I couldn't figure it out and I couldn't figure it out. And it was driving me crazy. And I was trying to figure it out in my head. And finally I looked it up. She plays a character on The Outsider. And it's like my favorite oh. character on The Outsider. And she mm-hmm. looks so different because her character on The Outsider has like braids. Mm-hmm. Long, beautiful braids. Totally crushing on her. Totally. Amazing. I mean, she's, amazing. Amazing. She's got Maybe. a body to die for. She's just classy and she mm-hmm. looks so charming. And her character on The Outsider is amazing. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. I agree. Huh. No, I'm a fan. I had to get rid of HBO, so I, I don't know about that Outsider yet, but maybe I'll live through it. Oh, get to it'll watch come it back your soon. House, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Come on over. Let's All start. right, Jen, you ready to uh, do this? It's a, well, let's just dive in. That's all I can say about this. I want to start off this episode with a very strong warning. It contains violent abuse and a subsequent death of a baby. Um, honestly, I debated even if I wanted to do this. I talked to you. We talked, both of us. And in the end, I decided it was important for a number of reasons. With, honestly, the first one being to honor this baby's short life. I mean, this is horrific. And it's very, you know, sometimes when all the the stars come in and mental illness, drug abuse, postpartum psychosis, all this comes together, it's just horrific. If you have problems listening to this, I would advise to skip ahead to next week, maybe, or to go backwards, right? Yep. There's no um, shame. I understand. Hell, I might not have to listen. Maybe if you catch me humming later, yeah. you'll know. All right. So you get that, people. If you don't like it, it's going to be really, really hard to listen to um, child abuse, brutality. It's awful. Here we go. Mm-hmm. So Blaine Milliam is 18 years old. And, you know, sadly, he's not a stranger to the prison system. You see, Blaine had just recently been released from jail and he was deemed a sex offender. Now, a sex offender that should have registered where he lived but failed to do so. Problem number one. Yeah. Blaine didn't have the easiest upbringing. He grew up in rural Texas, bouncing around from trailer park to trailer park. He grew up, but it's almost like he stopped intellectually maturing at around age 12. Okay. Oh, wow. And we'll get to that in a minute. But in fourth grade, he was removed from school by his father to be homeschooled. So Mm -hmm. he has a fourth grade education with some homeschooling. But, you know, home, homeschooling is not necessarily, you know, I'm sure most people have the best interest to do it for their child, but then other people, like I can speak from experience and I can't get into that too much. 
but somebody that yanked their kid out because they were lazy and didn't want to get up in the morning. So the kid didn't go to school. Mm -hmm. Okay. So during this time, he picked up a drug habit. He would use meth off and on throughout his life. And um, he would actually even try to commit suicide a few times during his young teenage years. Blaine at this time was serving time in jail for breaking into a home near where he was living. Once he was inside the home, he went to an 11-year-old girl's bedroom, and he proceeded to go through her belongings. And he left something there. He brought with him some, and I guess the only way to say this is adult magazine photos. So he would clip out the photos, and he would write messages on them for this 11-year-old girl. Oh, These messages contain details of what he would like to do with the young girl. I'm sorry, do you mean like pictures from Penthouse Magazine and stuff like that? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Some of the messages contain like, hey, you and I could do this. Why don't, you know, here's my number, call me, all this kind of stuff, right? So it was very over the top. Obviously, the family was very freaked out. Blaine was charged with criminal solicitation of a minor, never having had any physical contact with her, right? He didn't actually touch her. He never talked to her, but he was soliciting... I guess, sex with a minor. She's 11, right? So for this crime, Blaine was sentenced to spend 180 days in jail. This should have kept him in jail behind bars until February of 2008, right? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the problem. So this is a recent Uh, case, then, is what you're saying? uh, Recent-ish, 2008. 12 years ago. Mm, Yeah, I don't do math, you know that. So Blaine was supposed to stay in prison till 2008, and upon release, he'd have to obviously register as a sex offender, and then at that time, he could begin probation. Now, unfortunately, Jen, this is not quite how this all worked out. Blaine was allowed out of jail on a work release program, but was still expected to serve his full 180 days. But unfortunately, and now sadly, that's not what happened. He had served 48 days and then walked out to go to work and never came back. You know what? I think that's like the fourth or fifth case that we've done that that's happened with. Blaine moved to a new county and no one was aware of where he was, who he was, or what he did. Now, he's young. He's only 18 Mm -hmm. at this time, okay? It was shortly after his self-appointed release that he met Jessica Carson. Jessica was still in high school when in January 2008. Now, if you refer back, he should have still been in jail up to February 2008. Right. So we mm-hmm. met her a month early. Jessica met him and she was smitten, right? Jessica's also 18 and she was not just a high school teenager. She was also a mom to a baby girl by the name of Amora, which means love. Love. Mm-hmm. 18-year-old Jessica was immediately worried that Blaine wouldn't like her since, you know, she had a baby, but she could not be more wrong. Blaine would fall in love with both of them, and it was the night of prom, that's right, prom night, that Blaine would ask Jessica and her daughter to marry him. Soon after, they would all move in with Blaine. Amora had these big, beautiful, bright eyes. She was such a pretty little girl. When she grinned, her little eyes would light up, just like most babies. She was a very happy baby. And at the time that she had passed away, she was only 13 months old, 13 months old. She wasn't quite walking, but she was starting to talk and babble a little bit as these guys do as they're trying to find their language. And Blaine would proudly claim that Amora's first word was, in fact, daddy. I'm just kind of grossed out by all of this now. It wasn't long before things started to change, but why they changed still remains a bit of a mystery. What is not a mystery was that the last several hours, possibly days, of little Omora's life was torture with the sweet angel suffering, agonizing pain. On December 2nd, 2008, at 9.05 a.m., Blaine and Jessica were seen on security cameras in a local pawn shop. At the shop, the couple seemed calm and cool as they were talking with an attendant about pawning a chainsaw along with some of Blaine's tools. Now, if you look at the video, you can see the couple standing and talking with the attendant, but then after that, they start looking around the shop as if they were shopping on a sunny Saturday afternoon. Baby Amora was not with them in this video footage. After leaving the pawn shop, this is all on video too, by the way, After leaving the pawn shop, the couple would go to a local gas station as recorded by cameras. 
Jessica bought a soda and some cigarettes. Still, the couple were by themselves. Blaine would go ahead and fill up the car with gas at this time. At 10.37 a.m., a call would come into the 911 dispatch from Blaine's house. 2008, 16 hours, 48 minutes, 15 seconds. Rescue 911. My name is Blaine Mullen, and uh, my daughter, I just found her dead. How old's your daughter? 13 months. 13 months old? Okay, let me connect you with the ambulance service, okay? During the call, the operator tells Blaine to take the phone to Jessica. Jessica gets on the phone. The desperation is noticeable in the dispatch operator as Jessica seems to be dragging to perform CPR. <laughs> Ma'am, we're going to try CPR anyway, okay? Get her to the phone now. 51 minutes, 26 seconds. Get her. Blaine, get her, hurry. Are you there? Yes. Y'all stalling is not helping her at all. Go ahead. If he's not going to do it, you put the phone down and go get that baby and get her to the phone. Okay. First responders arrive and note that the baby wasn't breathing and had noticeable bruises. Amora's face had several abrasions on it, making it hard to see where one scrape ended and one started. While all of this was shocking to responders, it was... Ugh, this is terrible. The bite marks that left them silent. Bite and there mark, were many uh. bite marks. In fact, it was later determined during autopsy that Amora had 24 <sighs> human bite marks in all. On that tiny body? She had bite marks on her toes. Like when my kids were little, they would suck on my chin. She had bite marks over covering her nose and her mouth as if, well, you'll see why, what they suspect. But it was like over her mouth like you would. Yeah, it's horrible. An expert would later say on the stand that these bite marks were so deep and perfect, it would be easy to determine the person that did this. The house was filthy, and it was no place for anyone, much less a baby. It was filthy, filthy. Mm. Blaine and Jessica were separated immediately for questioning. Blaine would tell officers that he and Jessica had left the baby, but only for a short amount of time. They just took a walk up the road to talk to a man about clearing some land for them. They didn't mean to stay away that long. I know what you're thinking. And when they got back, they found Amora in this condition. And I know what you're thinking, who leaves a 13-month-old who can obviously crawl, whatever. My kids were crawling out of the crib at that time. They would say that time got away from them. And when they returned home, which was around an hour later, they found Amora in this condition. Blaine cooperated fully with police when they asked to search his car and his home. Now, Jessica told a similar story, except she claimed that she went to some property where they had, were planning to move their trailer to and started making plans and marking the land. And the time just kind of got away from them because they were excited about this. And when they returned, which was about an hour and a half later, they found Amora in the condition that she was. Now, obviously, the stories are not matching up and the police, they know what's up, right? Right. So Jessica, they're you pulled so, apart. Anyway. Yeah, they're pulled apart. Jessica's questioned again, but this time by a Texas Ranger. During this time, she told a completely different story. And it is hard to believe, but it's even harder to hear. Blaine and Jessica would say things started to happen. Weird things. Now, during me researching all this, Jen, I, you know me and my TV. I found a show called On Death Row, which is a documentary series produced by Werner Herzog, and he did the um, Into the Abyss, which is one of my favorite crime docs ever, Into mm -hmm. the Abyss. Go check it out. So this was a series of profiles of death row inmates talking about their crimes. And Blaine is featured in season two, episode three. Herzog is very against the death penalty. I think he does a pretty good job of presenting the case as it is and then having you decide. Just go watch it. I think he does a good job. If you didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to the case, if you didn't know anything about it, mm -hmm. I don't think you would really know that he's very, very anti-death penalty. Okay? Gotcha. Okay. So in the show, Jessica was interviewed and tells about how all of this started to happen. Jessica says that after Blaine's father had passed away, they bought a Ouija board, thinking uh -huh. that they would be able to communicate with Blaine's father. Now, Jessica claims also that her father 
had passed away when she was only 10 years old, so they were hoping to communicate with her father as well. Now, Jessica says at first they were really enjoying this, that they were getting a lot of feedback. In fact, she states that one night they sat up playing for eight hours, eight hours communicating with what they thought were Blaine's father and Jessica's father. Her quote was, And so we did that. You know, this is like a telephone to heaven. We thought it was really cool and everything. So we just, we kept talking to our dads, telling them how much we miss them. And, you know, and we talked to them for about eight hours straight that night. And we started getting really freaked out. And we got this little music box from one of our friends that's Chinese and has these (laughs) Chinese people singing. You know, God will protect us. Demons leave this house. That was her directly from her during that documentary. Mm -hmm. So Blaine would say that Jessica thought the cat was possessed by a demon. Then Jessica thought the apartment was possessed by demons. Blaine then claims that Jessica had told him that Amara was also possessed. Jessica had said that the devil went inside her and told her he, meaning the devil, was going to take Blaine's soul that very night. Jessica would say the devil inside Blaine told her that God told him it was too late for that. Blaine told Jessica that if Amara didn't die right then, her soul would belong to Satan for the rest of her life. Jessica decided they needed to have an exorcism to get rid of it. An exorcism of baby Amara. Okay, so first of all, they're uneducated, right? They're young. And what drugs Mm -hmm. are they doing? Seriously. He's been doing meth on and off. She, um, I think, honestly, I think she's suffering from a little postpartum psychosis. So things, I mean, the baby's only 13 months old. And if you're not getting mental help, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, that's, mm, okay. Yeah. Jessica claims she wanted to get some money together to talk to a minister, get a priest to do an exorcism. But Blaine had said that God said it was too late. Blaine stated Now, this is what Jessica is saying, because Jessica and Blaine kind of ended up going against each other. Mm -hmm. Blaine stated, quote, if she doesn't go to heaven now, she will live her life with Satan having her, her soul, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a quote. And this is where the pawn shop video comes into play. Jessica would say that they were pawning Blaine's tools, a chainsaw and some other tools, to get money to hire a priest. They would claim that they left the baby at home during this time to go get that money, but that baby Amora was alive when they left. 18 years old. That's what I teach. No, I know. I know. And they're uneducated and they're on drugs and they have a mental disorder, which doesn't do well when you're taking all those drugs. And they should probably have not had a a child. Been alone. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sure there's nobody that would, they had in their lives that would help them. Well, I think they did actually have a support system of sorts. Blaine's mom would go on. This is me ad living from what I read. But Blaine's mom would go on to say that after Blaine's dad left, they spiraled. Like things just started happening. That was really weird. Things weren't okay. And I guess if Blaine was really distraught over his dad dying, and maybe he was doing drugs, and then she wasn't the most stable either. Usually with postpartum depression, it only lasts a little while, but if it goes untreated, it goes, it's not really postpartum anymore. It, they got together early, January. She died in December. So the baby was only three months old when they met. Postpartum normally lasts a few months. You know what I mean? I, um, I don't know about that. I'm just saying, I'm just stating the facts, yeah. ma'am. Just the facts. But it could last longer if it goes untreated, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But the psychosis would, I mean, you do have hallucinations and delusions and obsessively mm-hmm. you're confused yeah. so i don't know but up, you're up paranoid. to this point jessica was a good mom to her up to this point blaine was seemingly a good i guess step father figure in her life but let's get back to the story okay now blaine would claim that when they arrived back home they had found amora in a hole in the bathroom floor now there was a hole in the floor because the bathroom was being remodeled and let me just state right now jen there's no remodeling that place was a dump. It was terrible. It was filthy. It was disgusting. Like, I don't even want to say hoarding because they were only 18 years old. It was just dirty. It was filthy. Now, Blaine later changed his story, saying Jessica called the police 
before they had found Amora, and when they found her, she was already dead. Blaine denied any involvement in the death of the baby. He still does to this day, but so does she. Blaine's sister stated that she got a phone call from Blaine around 9.30 a.m. that morning, that very morning, and that Blaine had said that they had found Amora dead, okay? Which is a little bit different than than the uh, 911 calls and all that stuff, Uh but we'll get into that. So Blaine and Jessica are taken into custody. They are going to the station for more questioning. Investigators go to work and try to put the puzzle pieces together of what happened. Blaine's mother would say the two of them began to lose the grasp of reality after Blaine's dad had died. This combined with Blaine's use of meth and Jessica's possible postnatal psychosis all led to this tragedy. Jessica tells Texas Ranger Kenny Ray that Blaine loved Amora and would never hurt her. When Ray tells her that they are lying to him and their stories don't match up, she starts to cry. And she tells him that she loved that baby and would never hurt her. As Ray pushes her to fess up, Jessica says, I could tell you, but you wouldn't believe me. And this is in regards to, I'm going to tell you what happened, but you're not going to believe me. And that would be in regards to the exorcism, right? Uh As the couple were being interviewed, officers worked at the scene. Investigators were told that the crime had occurred in the front bedroom. So that's where they started. There was blood, and it looked as if this was where little Amara lost her life. But that wasn't true. As officers continued to investigate, there were trace amounts of blood in a back bedroom. They also found some blood on a onesie, uh, the little girl's onesie, as well as some other physical evidence. You see, the first bedroom was fake. It was fake blood. It was all staged. The couple had actually placed fake blood in that first bedroom. It was all fake. And they wanted the officers to believe that that's where the crime had happened. DNA evidence would be found in that back bedroom, proving that this is where little Amara lost her life. A family member phoned police a little bit after this, telling them to look underneath the home. A search warrant was issued and more evidence was located under the home, which matched the evidence found in the house. Did you get all that? There's yeah. fake blood. They There's put fake, fake blood. blood. In the, and I, and this They're is, trying to throw off but I don't, the police, what, right? But I don't get this. Why would you do that? Like, the police are going to know that that's fake blood. Because and why would you? they're not smart, for one. They're uneducated. Let's put it that way. And they think that the police wouldn't know what they're doing. They're trying to throw the police off their scent. I guess, honestly, at 18, you would. You probably don't look into DNA and all that stuff. I'm going to have to go over that. They're not. They have no education. No. And they're young. So they're just thinking that. Yeah, they're so young. At this time, Blaine and Jessica are arrested for the brutal death of beautiful Amara Carson. Now, I'm going to share some very graphic details here, Jen. So if you don't want to hear this or any people don't want to hear this, turn this off. Now, honestly, I debated about this, if this was something that I should include. You know, like as as we write this stuff, you and I and everybody, podcasters, think is this important. But honestly, there's a few things in here that I think people need to know only because I think it either shows mental illness. I think it's important, but it is sickening to hear. Honestly. Uh So prepare yourself. During the trial, District Attorney Michael Memberson started the trial with an apology. He apologized for what the jurors were about to hear and what they would have to go through during this trial. He warned jurors how brutal the murder was and added that the police who worked that crime scene that morning, that afternoon, Uh they consistently have nightmares from it. It's heartbreaking. Uh Amara's injuries were so heinous that in court, a forensic pathologist that testified, named Dr. Keith Picard, said that several of them could have been the fatal blow, the one fatal blow that did her in. He added that the injuries were the worst he's ever seen inflicted on a child. It was determined that a hammer had been the main weapon and crushed her skull, but that was not all. This sweet baby had extensive bleeding under her scalp, multiple Mm. fractures 
on her back and her head, brain lacerations, 18 rib fractures, over 24 bite marks all over her 25-pound body, a lacerated liver, a broken arm, a broken leg. She may have been strangled at some point due to a bleeding blood vessel in her neck, but they couldn't be sure. They were able to match bite marks on Amora, and Jessica was excluded from all of them but one. The rest belonged to Blaine. The autopsy also revealed that this angel baby had been sexually assaulted. Her genitalia and rectum were badly bruised, but it wasn't from male penetration, but rather from an object insertion. Dr. Picard stated that most, if not all, of these injuries happened while she was alive. That poor baby. Bite marks. Do you know how bad a bite hurts? Seriously. And I know, I know. I'm trying not to cry. I'm trying to hold it in. Woo. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just because it's terrible. Blaine's defense attorney, Stephen Jackson, would claim that it was Jessica, depressed and delusional after giving birth to Amora. He would say she was the one that killed the baby. Jackson told jurors that Blaine had a low IQ and was, in fact, much like a child. And I got this from the documentary, and it's, it's shocking. Blaine would talk about cartoons a lot. In fact, while the jury was out deciding if Blaine should get the death penalty or not, they watched Scooby-Doo cartoons. When the verdict was back, there was a knock at the door. Blaine wanted to finish the cartoon. He literally didn't understand what was going on. Somebody knocked at the door saying the verdict's in on if you're going to receive death or not. And he said, can we just finish the cartoon? When he did hear the verdict, Stephen said that Blaine leaned over to him and said, why do these people not like me? Why do they want to kill me? Don, and here's a name for you, Don Killingsworth was Jessica's attorney, and he was adamant that Jessica not testify in her own defense by evoking the Fifth Amendment. As Jessica was led into the courtroom in shackles, her attorney asked her if she was going to be invoking her Fifth Amendment right not to testify, and she said yes. When asked if she would be called to testify, would she again invoke her Fifth Amendment right, and she said yes, she would not testify. Now, it was pretty clear that there was no evidence that the couple was on drugs at the time of the murder. But they also had a mental, or at least he did. I know. He was only 12 years old. Like, mentally, he was 12 years old. He should have never been in charge of a baby. Ever. Yep. Not to mention he was trying to pick up the 11-year-old. But, okay, I digress. Well, that's because he's got a mentality of a 12-year-old. That's, mm, never mind. There was no evidence that the couple was on drugs at the time of the murder, and there was no drugs found in the home, even though Blaine had been a meth user, possibly getting some brain damage from the drug use, combined with the low IQ. Mm -hmm. In fact, and I don't want to say this because we just said it the last episode, but they would say he was mentally retarded. Now, we don't say that these days in education. Well, but but you know what's sad Mm -hmm. is that was in the early 2000s, -2000s. Mm mid-2000s. And that Mm -hmm. wasn't that long ago. That Mm -hmm. was just more uneducated people. Yeah. Well, (laughs) no, that's just what they called it. That's what they called it. Now it's intellectual disability. So Jessica standing in court with her head nodding as her sentence was being read to her. Jessica received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Richard Motina, Amora's grandfather, made the following statement. And this is a quote. Jesse, this has been one of the worst days of my life. I thought long, on end, what I was going to tell you. Heather has suffered. I've suffered. And Arlene has called me constantly. I want you to know I don't hate you. I hate the acts y'all committed. It's affected the lives of not only me and my family, but many jury members. No matter how much punishment you receive, you will never suffer the way my granddaughter did. We did care, and I still care. Amora is in my home, in picture frames. That's all I have left of her, besides her daddy, who served his country. You're getting off easy compared to what she got. At age 20, Blaine was sentenced to death by lethal injection, making him the youngest person to ever be on death row in the state of Texas at the time of his sentencing. In May of 2012, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeal upheld the death sentence for Blaine. Defense lawyers tried to say that there were more than 20 errors that happened during his trial but the Court of Appeals didn't agree. Now, although he had exhausted all of his appeals at this time, 
a Texas judge issued a stay of execution on January 14th, 2019. So it was a year and a month from today. Although he exhausted all of his appeals, a Texas judge issued a stay of execution on January 14th, 2019, just one day before his execution was scheduled to be carried out. Can you imagine? One day Mm -hmm. before he was about to be killed. The reason changes in intellectual disability law and bite Mm -hmm. mark science. They were trying to prove that the bite mark science was junk science and that having a mental disability, you know, that you should not be sent to death for that. Well, I think they have ruled that bite mark science is junk science now. But, yeah, it's pretty much they kind of admitted that they are. They were saying that he had, they called it like an M mark, like his teeth kind of made an M. So it Mm -hmm. was pretty... His teeth weren't straight, and it, they had a very unique pattern, so it was easy to right. see that he did that, right? Right. Well, I believe that you can do that, but I do believe that it's it's called junk science now. But a lot of things, uh, luminol is junk science now, because you can prove that's wrong. If you use luminol and you've used bleach, bleach reacts to luminol. Uh, horseradish does luminol, you know what I mean? So things yeah, that have I been gotcha. taken f- as fact have, you know what I'm saying. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So currently, Blaine is still in Texas. He has uh, had the stay of execution, so he's not currently. They're still investigating. He still could die for this, as Jessica is serving life. When asked about this, like, why did it happen? What happened to Amora? And his comment is, and this is a quote, why did it happen? Why did it happen? Why? It's all, I mean, I know we shouldn't ask why, but, you know, we want questions. Why did it all happen? Why did it happen like this? Why couldn't it have been me? You know, why couldn't, Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't understand it. I wish I could go back and stop it, but I can't. I don't know how it got so far. I don't understand how it got this far, but it did. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Yeah. His mom, by the way, thinks he's innocent. His mom thinks he did not do it, Mm -hmm. that Jessica must have done it. As you can see, you know, people, they go back and forth and they blame each other. So Jessica says he did it. He says Jessica did it. Two things that I thought that, and I stated that earlier, important to include in the graphic details of the baby, and that was the bite marks. And I, I don't even know how to say this, but like bite marks to to get a demon out of a child. And then the other thing that really bothered me, and maybe somebody knows this, and I, I already the know the hammer that, that um, they used to beat out the demons. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty. That's but also the sexual abuse, gross. the penetration of a foreign object. That really bothered me. I don't understand that. Well, the whole I mean, thing is pretty bothered. I don't understand. Exactly. But the penetration of the child that, to me, screams Blaine all over it. I mean, he's pa- had power. That, like, he's been caught with these sexual fantasies and this is what I'm going to do with you. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's it's not going to be his mo- her mom. It's not going to be Amora's mom. No, and that's the thing. I think... I think the bottom line is this. I think that she truly believed people were possessed. I think that she believed that Blaine was possessed and that they were both going to be taken from her, that they were the devil was going to take both Blaine and the baby away so that they thought, well, you know what? Her. I think she thought we have to fix this. And then Blaine was like, this is, you know, it's gone too far. Let me go get the hammer. But I, I just... I can't get over the bite marks. I can't get over the hammer to the head. And I can't, I can, I mean, none They're of this. Months old. The, Babies. Yeah, this This sounds like I'm trying to rationalize. I'm trying to find the ill rationalization. Is that a word? I'm trying to find that in this when the whole thing is irrational, you know? Like yeah. it, this little baby girl's 13 months. But all I can say is go watch On Death Row and it's season two. And this is uh, from like 2010, 2013, somewhere in mm-hmm. there. But during the uh, Werner Herzog interviewing these people, he goes and interviews Tammy, cousin Tammy. She is a cousin of Blaine. OK, let me just uh-huh. say this. Cousin Tammy states that she believes you can get possessed by the devil and she has played with Ouija boards before. Quote, I seen bad things happen. I ain't touch one since. Tammy goes on to talk about the movie The Exorcist, and, well, she thinks the movie's real. She really does. She believes that Linda Blair was really possessed, and the priest had a heart attack live, and he died while they were filming that movie. All of this was live. She believes Mm -hmm. it was a reality TV show, basically, a reality movie. I guess so. A documentary. And she said, quote, there's no way you can turn your head all around like that and not die from that. 
She did, however, say that she believed there's no way a baby could be possessed. The, the Lord would never allow that. You just got to watch it. It's, wow. If you want to know more about this, it's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Jen, you got to watch Because seriously, I watched that and I was like, are you kidding me? So then no. I had to watch it like three times. She thinks it was being filmed as it happened. And that's mm-hmm. fine. That's fine. But it's this lends to the, and I'm not being mean, you know, trust me, each their own. But it lends to the caliber of people, like very, God, I don't even want to say. They're uneducated. That's what it boils down to. I don't want to say that because I don't know Cousin Tammy, but. No, well, you can, she is uneducated and she is ignorant of things. She really thought Linda Blair, the actress, was possessed. Nobody can turn their head around like that. I had to watch that like three times. And just because you 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 say somebody is in uneducated or ignorant does not mean you think they are stupid there are just know, things I that just they don't i know but i just feel understand guilty. Guilty. i don't they fucking killed a 13 month old baby by hitting it over the head with a hammer and bit her all over her body i have feel no guilt calling them ignorant i know babies did better not off, deserve that honestly the fake blood thing. Why would they do that? Like, I don't get, like, what's the difference? The baby's. To try to throw everybody off is what I would But the think. baby's, the baby's dead. Like, I didn't even put this all in there because I was like, I can't back it up. I can't really find any sources. The, the baby had been dead for hours, like hours. Mm-hmm. So, like, when the police officer went there, the baby was stiff. So it wasn't like she had Rigor died had set hours, mm-hmm. hours earlier. Yeah. So, so Rick Mortis like, had set in. And then the weird part, like, that they left a 13-month-old at home by herself for an hour and a half. What? What? They don't know. They it's they had the mental capabilities of a 12-year-old. Mm-hmm. They yeah. should have never had been alone to raise their child. That poor baby had nobody to protect her at nope. all. Nothing. All right, Jen, that's that's it. That's all I got. That was a, if anybody else has any information about this, I, I would like to hear it. I know that he is still doing his day of execution. That could change depending on when they um, come up and go through his, I guess, evidence and if the bite mark and the junk science, if you will, and mm-hmm. also his low IQ, things like that. That's all I got, Jen. So is he going to be sentenced at any time or is he going to just live on death? Well, he was on death row and then it's, it's, it's he stay. gets to stay, meaning so, they have to go look at it again and see. She was sentenced to life in prison without. All right, so he still has a good chance to be fried, or they get they don't fry in Texas anymore, do they? They do this uh, needle, right? Lethal injection. Yep. Yeah. So there's still a chance that that could happen. You didn't I looked all week. Just no, I looked all week to check and make sure I was on on um you know checking. But you know how slow they are, so I don't know. Yeah. They'll, they'll come out and and uh, reevaluate that. If his IQ is really that low, I would think that they uh, would not give him death, life, but not death. So, I mean, yeah. he was yanked out of school in fourth grade. So that's, what, 10 years old? Somewhere around there. Yep. I don't know still. Hey, well, here's the deal. If you guys think you know a child that is being abused or is being abused, you could call the Child Help National Child Abuse Hotline at one 800 422 44 Five three. That's one eight hundred four two two four four five three. Call them now. Even help that baby. All right. So all right. Well, before you go, before you uh, go, we have one final thing that you need to listen to. It is our friend Jenny and her podcast, Murder Up North. We are going to play her promo right after this is over. So go listen. She's great. Remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye bye Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at artruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. 
We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. Hi, I'm Jenny, the host of It's Murder Up North. If you're curious about the murderous north of England, this podcast is definitely for you. I've lived in various parts of the north of England. I went to college in the shadow of Saddleworth Moor, where Myra Hindley and Ian Brady buried those five innocent children. I've worked in the city of Leeds, where the Yorkshire Ripper targeted his victims in the 1970s. Knowing how geographically close I've been to these crimes made me curious, and that curiosity became this podcast. However, my main hope is to help you see the person, not the victim. Yep, it's we weird are. because every so often your voice just goes, it'll go, like you said, Blaine, it'll go, Blaine. Well, it's also weird. Like, I have, like, my little, um, there, it, you should see me talking. It's tiny, tiny, like the, the line, tiny. Yeah. I'm, we'll put it on that waveform uh, FB or whatever, where the audio track on the side. It's still weird, though. I mean, it's just like, it's not, you know, normally it's a little bit higher and bigger. Whatever. It, I, I, if it's horrible, I'm, I'm going to do it again. I don't know. What to say. I don't know. What to say. Figuring out. Good thing we're only doing this two years and we've almost got it figured out, Jan. Duh. Well, I'll send you a picture of what I'm talking about and um, that'll help get oh. your wavelengths bigger. Bigger. You know, I like bigger wavelengths. Mm-hmm. Forensic pathologist named Dr. Keith Picard said that no. several of them P I N C K A R D. Pin. Yeah. Yeah. There's an, there is an N in there. Pincard. Picard. Oh, p- yeah, but at the beginning. Pincard. Pincard? Pincard? How do you say it? Pink card. Yeah. Just uh, maybe even Picard. just like Miss Nadar. Put it all together, right? Picard? Pinkard? Pinkard. I'm going to put his name in there because I'm going to try. Because people get on um, the crime crime losers saying that they... A famous pathologist said, right? They don't give the name. And I'm giving credit oh. where credit's due. Just saying. I never do. All right, here we go. Because their names are usually too hard to say. So I'm, I don't do I'd it. rather say it wrong and give them credit than not give them credit. But here we go.